So with that, again, this is the 30 Years War. Um, we did this cast once before. It was hosted by Bella Blanton. I'm going to be doing it again tonight. I'm Chris Clancy. I was an AP Euro teacher in the United States. I'm an AP reader. Uh, I live in New Zealand now. Um, and so I do know a lot about the AP exam. I know about the course and the content. Uh, so hopefully I can help you guys be successful. So in this stream, basically what we're going to do is we're going to go through the phases of the war. Um, we're going to give you the context of the war, why the war started, uh, the, P, uh, the Peace of Westphalia and how that happened and what the outcomes of that were. And then we're going to practice some point of view analysis. I know in my stream from yesterday, I talked about how point of view, in my opinion, is the hardest for students to do. I really do think that is. So this is going to be some great practice for you guys. I did put up some questions for you guys um, for you to comment along the way. Uh, and I'll answer as we go through just to kind of give you some guideposts so we can see where you guys are. So context for the war. Okay, there are a lot of things going on here uh, when it comes to why this war happened, how this war broke out. Uh, this war wasn't just something that all of a sudden just started. Okay, This was almost a century, uh, if not a century in the making, right? So we start first with the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, oftentimes when we think of the Holy Roman Empire, most people just think of Germany. And that's for the most part, that's true. Uh, it was mostly Germany, but it also included modern day Austria, as well as the Czech Republic, parts of Slovakia, uh, parts of the Spanish Netherlands, which would become the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, it had parts of Poland. So it was a very, very big multi-ethnic, multilingual uh, empire that was very loosely connected through what was known as the Holy Roman Emperor. He was an elected emperor. Okay. Uh, for the continent of Europe, this empire was incredibly important. It literally sat in the middle of everything. Okay? You could not get something from Russia without it having to pass through the Holy Roman Empire. You couldn't get something from England to Russia without it having to pass through the Holy Roman Empire. So it was very important economically. Uh, this is where we see the Hanseatic League develop. It's where we know about a lot of guilds developing from the Middle Ages. So it's economically probably one of the most important parts of Europe at the time after Spain. Uh, the issue with this is that because it's made up of so many different parts, right? There is no unity, okay? The Holy Roman Emperor was just an emperor in name. He really didn't have a lot of power, okay? Uh, power was vested in the princes uh, that would elect him as the emperor. And so these princes were the ones who had the real power, right? They're the ones who got involved in your everyday life, who you pay taxes to, who were the judge, jury, and executioner if you got you know, in trouble with the law, something like that, okay? Uh, with the Protestant Reformation, this semi-unity we at least have through Catholicism is gone, right? And that means that there's gonna be a massive shift in the power center within the Holy Roman Empire, okay? Because the Holy Roman Emperor is Catholic. He's usually situated along with the Austrian family, the Habsburgs, who at that time were also the kings of Spain as well. The uh, Northern part of the Holy Roman Empire was aligned with Martin Luther, uh, who was the Protestant reformer. And basically what ended up happening is part of the Catholic counter-reformation was that the Pope and the Council of Trent declared Luther and all of his followers to be heretics and a threat to the stability of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, that meant that they were also threatening the Holy Roman Emperor. And so we're setting ourselves up for this war. Uh, in 1555, we did have the Peace of Augsburg, which was supposed to have kind of settled this where we're not going to break the empire apart. What we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, if you live in a principality with a Catholic prince, you're Catholic. If you live in a principality with a Lutheran prince, you're Lutheran. Um, it's the known as quius uh, regio eus religio, he who rules his faith. Uh, but the problem is, is that by the time the Thirty Years' War starts, the emperor had decided, no, no, I am the emperor. This is my land. You will all follow my faith doesn't work when you don't have a united empire. And so he's setting himself up for this war. 
Um, again, that split in the empire, it, it's not really half and half so much as we uh, like would like to think it is. Um, it's more just kind of along a uh, geographical line. Southern German, uh, Holy Roman Empire is going to remain Catholic along with the you know, Mediterranean states. And then the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire is going to go to the Protestant side along like the English Reformation went to Protestant and the Scandinavian countries. Um, the Peace of Augsburg, again, one of the things that this was supposed to do was supposed to prevent war by saying you can be Lutheran, but you got to live in a Lutheran state. You can be Catholic, but you got to live in a Catholic state. Um, because there were some wars between the Catholics and the Lutherans within the Holy Roman Empire that were threatening to tear the whole empire apart. And the Peace of Augsburg was supposed to uh, prevent that. Now, the Catholic princes here, they are not happy because one of the things is, is that Catholicism had made a resurgence. They had taken more land away from the Protestants. And under the Peace of Augsburg, they had to give that back because it's all going back to the original prince who was in charge of that land. And so if you were a Catholic prince and you had conquered, let's say, Saxony, because it's the one I can think of right now, and Saxony was a very large territory, and you were Catholic, so therefore you're making everybody else Catholic. Along comes this piece of Augsburg that says, nope, you got to get out. You can't have it. You can't take it. And the original prince is coming back, and all of these people are going back to Lutheranism. You've lost an economic place. You've lost political power. You've lost social standing because you've lost your, your followers, your people. But the Catholic princes could kind of have a little bit of, I'm not sure what you would like to say, you know, smug looks about themselves because, yes, Momo, come here. Come here, Momo. Come say hello to everybody. Yeah, I know. You want everybody to see you because you're yelling. Everybody, this is Momo. He's very loud. I apologize. All right. I'm going to keep him here for most of my stream to kind of keep him quiet. Uh, so... Are you going to be quiet now? Okay, good boy. All right, so anyways, as I was saying, the Peace of Augsburg was only between Lutherans and Catholics. The Calvinists that were living within the Holy Roman Empire and the princes that had converted to Calvinism were left out, which meant that the Catholic princes could kind of sneak in and take their land, take their followers, take their, their economy and their economic output. So, I mean, they didn't, weren't happy with the Peace of Augsburg overall, but they could at least have something. Calvinism, though, was a very special form of the Protestant Revolution, uh, Reformation because Calvinism believed in the idea of predestination. It believed in the idea that you had to live an austere and very humble life, uh, which was very different from Lutheranism. Lutheranism did not say you had to live an austere life. Lutheranism... Um, did not say that you had to be humble, all right? I mean, when the German Peasants' Revolt happened, Luther very much was against the German Peasants' Revolt because he knew that the princes were the ones protecting him. And so he was all about that idea of God put you as the prince and in power with money and all that, which Calvinism went against. So Calvinism, though, what it tried to do was it was trying to exert itself um, as a way to kind of be a buffer zone between the Lutherans and the Catholics. That's why we see Calvinism take root in the Spanish Netherlands. Um, the issue is, is that Lutheran ideas do not agree with the Calvinist ideas. One, two of those main ones, the idea of missionaries, okay, um, Calvinists are aggressively missionary at this time. They are trying to convert a lot of people. Lutherans don't believe in that at this time. They are very much, if you're going to be a Lutheran, you're going to come to it on your own. Uh, if you're not, that's your choice. There also is the idea of transubstantiation, which is a bigger issue, not just between Calvinists and Lutherans, but between Lutherans and Catholics and all of Christianity. It's the idea of when you do the blood and the wine at the... Uh, Eucharist in church, are you literally drinking blood and eating the body, or are you doing a figurative or a, um, what's the word? Um, I can't remember the word, sorry, where it, it represents symbolic, that's what I was looking for, a symbolic gesture of drinking blood and eating the body of Christ. Um, having to say you don't. 
Adams do not believe in transubstantiation. Okay. Um, and so that's the big issue between them and the Lutherans. We also have the formation of what's known as the Catholic League. This is a league that was formed to protect Catholic uh, rulers as well as the Catholic faith and to uh, kind of stop any further spread of the Reformation uh, within Catholic held lands. Jesuits are gonna be the ones who are gonna start this. They're the ones who are going out and converting people back to Catholicism. Um, I did a stream a couple of weeks ago about the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Uh, and, and then I said, you know, the Catholic Counter-Reformation, incredibly successful, very, very successful, much more successful than Luther's Reformation or the English Reformation. Uh, if we look at to today, there are over a billion Catholics, okay? That's how successful they are at their Catholic Counter-Reformation, okay? The idea of the Catholic League eventually evolves into a political organization um, led by Maximilian I. And basically what he's doing is he wants to prevent the princes in this area right here. This is the Northern Holy Roman Empire, Denmark, and then the kings of Sweden and Norway from invading and spreading more Catholic, or excuse me, more Protestant ideas down here into the rest of the Holy Roman Empire, this green area right here. So he's trying to stop the leader of the Protestant Alliance, Frederick the Fourth. Okay. Uh, the Catholic League, there's some skirmishes between them. There's some arguments between the two sides, but we're still not yet into all out war. And then this happens. This is probably my favorite thing that happens during the uh, 30 years war because it's such a fantastical story. Um, and we really get a look at the beginnings of what you can say is like propaganda. Okay. Because we have what's known as the defenestration of Prague. All right, the defenestration of Prague, uh, defenestrate, it comes from the Latin and Italian defenestra, meaning to throw out the window. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor sends in representatives of him and the Catholic Church, telling the people of Bohemia, you will return to Catholicism. You will become Catholics. We no longer have the Peace of Augsburg. It is my way or it is death. And so they chose death. Now, the way they chose death, this depends on who you believe, okay? Because what they did is they threw out the representatives, the priests and the diplomats, out the window. Now, if you were a Protestant, they believed that because they threw them out the window, when they landed in the steaming pile of horse crap, which is what they said happened, that was God's way of saying Protestants were correct. The Catholics fell on horse crap. Catholics, on the other hand, said that because they threw them out the window with the intent of killing them, that they didn't die because they landed in this horse crap, that God was telling them Catholics are right. Catholic is the way to go. It is all about propaganda here. Okay. And it's probably one of the best stories I've ever heard about a religious argument on how you can say God is on your side. Because one way you look at it, it doesn't matter. They fell in horse crap. That's disgusting. Okay. I don't care if you're Catholic, Protestant, or Muslim, or Jewish. I don't think any of us want to fall on horse crap. But it's a way to spin it and to get people to follow you. That defenestration of Prague kicks off what we know as the Bohemian phase. Okay, King Ferdinand was an adamant Catholic. He uh, definitely wanted his people to be Catholic. He wanted them to return to Catholicism. Um, there had been what were known as special dispensations given to the Protestants of the time uh, since Rudolf II. They're known as letters of majesty. Uh, and King Ferdinand says, nope, no more letters of majesty. You're going to be Catholic. Okay. The defenestration officially happens in 1618, starting that war. You've got a couple of different examples here. You can see on the top right here, this is one example of the defenestration. Um, you've got a bottom left here where they're arguing over, you know, what do we do with them? Uh, we go back. You've got an etching at the top here showing the defenestration of Prague. It's just a great little anecdote from history. I absolutely love it. So there is a new election for a Holy Roman Emperor because Matthias, the Holy Roman Emperor, has died. And guess who the princes elect? 
they elect Ferdinand. Now, Ferdinand, that name should sound somewhat familiar to you. That's because he is named after his grandfather, King Ferdinand of Spain. That's how Catholic we're talking here. He is the direct descendant of the guy who started the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody suspected. Okay, If you don't know that joke, you need to watch uh, the Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail. Uh, anyways, Bohemians, they're not very happy at all with the fact that Ferdinand has been put in as the Holy Roman Emperor, because now they're really, really kind of between a rock and a hard place. Uh, so what happens um, is that they are going to replace Ferdinand the King with Frederick the Elector, who was known, he was a Calvinist. He's the Winter King. So this is just of Bohemia. This isn't of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay? And that's, the, that's why this makes it so weird in the Holy Roman Empire. Because when Ferdinand gets promoted to the Holy Roman Emperor, he's still technically the King of Bohemia. But the Bohemians went, well, you got promoted, so we're kicking you out. We want Frederick because he's at least a Protestant. Okay? Because Ferdinand is also going in the descendant of a Spanish king, um, Spain says, well, we're going to protect our, our descendants here. We need to protect our family. They're sending troops in. Um, and then we start to see the beginnings of, sorry, my nose itches, of the war as the Catholic League and the Protestant League start to get involved here. Uh, Ferdinand is also sent help from Bavaria and Saxony. Uh, and he is given back his electoral title as well as he gains territory here because they crush the Bohemians. Absolutely crush the Bohemians, okay? Um, the reason why they do that is that the Lutheran Calvinist divisions, they can't agree on how to fight either. So they don't not just agree here on, you know, the dogma and the practice of religion. They don't agree on how to fight this war either, which comes to the Battle of White Mountain, which was the first crushing victory of the Catholic League over the Protestants. By two years later, after White Mountain, Frederick, the Winter King, he's gone. Ferdinand is again in control of Bohemia, and he sets up what is a authoritarian state. Um, you have Protestants burnt at the stake, Protestants who are killed left and right, um, kept people who would fake convert and go to church in public and say they're Catholic at home, do Protestant beliefs. So there's this a lot of division still, and there's a lot of back and forth because there's no true, we're not done yet with this war, right? Because re Catholicizing Bohemia is going to take a lot of time, okay? And it's not going to be completely successful, right? Once you start to kill people that you consider to be on the wrong side, it doesn't really matter whether they were or not, because if they have people that agree with them, you've turned them into martyrs. Okay, I love this saying that I learned when I was in college that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Well, here in this case, the Bohemians looked at themselves as freedom fighters and Ferdinand and the Catholics looked at them as terrorists. And so it's two sides almost of the same coin, right? And it's very difficult when you're trying to destroy that. If you destroy one side, you're destroying the other and you basically destroy the whole thing. So there's a reason why the war didn't end here, because it could have, and it probably should have. The issue was, is that Protestants weren't giving up without a fight. Okay, the re um, recatholicizing, recatholization of the empire wasn't something they were just going to give into. Also, we start to see the beginnings of the use of mercenaries. Mercenaries are people who just fight for money. They don't necessarily fight for cause. So they're going to go to whomever's going to pay them the highest coin. Well, if I am the richest elector in the Holy Roman Empire and I am Protestant, I can hire the most amount of mercenaries. And thus, I can continuously keep fighting the war. But more importantly, it's also the fact that as Ferdinand was going through and sweeping through the Holy Roman Empire trying to crush the Protestants, he forgot that there were these other smaller kingdoms that had converted to Protestantism that weren't going to allow this. And that's what leads us to the next phase, because the king of Denmark invades. Now, between you and me and a rock post, not the brightest thing to do ever, okay? Um, and so what we are going to do, I'm going to stop here for a second, and I want to take a moment to 
uh, look at one of the questions that I asked, which is why was England not involved in the Thirty Years' War? This is oftentimes a question I used to get in my classroom all the time, because we talk about the four phases and we talk about England being uh, Protestant and then, you know, having their own issues with constitutionalism developments at the time. We don't really talk about them being involved in the Thirty Years' War. But during this time frame of the Danish phase, as it's starting, we know that they are, okay? Uh, what we know is that Stuart England at the time, that's the ruling family, uh, they are intermarrying with the royal houses of the Netherlands and of Denmark, and that is intertwining them and bringing them into this war. But more importantly, we also know that the Church of England has adopted some of the Lutheran views uh, at the uh, when they have the great concession by Queen Elizabeth, where she brings in Catholics and Protestants together. Those adoption of Lutheran views means that the English have a fight to pick. They want to be involved. They just don't get involved formally. Okay, so the English are involved here. They're just not involved on a grand scale like the other countries are when they fight in the war. They're involved more in a background phase. English warriors would go and they would fight, but they wouldn't fight under the banner of England. They would normally fight under the banner of the Dutch or the Danish or the Swedish. So the English were involved, uh, they're just not officially involved. So that's just something that we always get asked in class, but I wanted to talk about here as we get into the Danish phase. So the Danish phase, not the brightest thing ever. <laughs> uh, Denmark, if you can see on the map of the right here, it's a very tiny country, it's not very big. Um, Denmark uh, has a lot of coastland, which is really great. Um, Denmark has a lot of Protestants, which is really great. But Denmark doesn't have a really good army. Denmark doesn't have a really big army. And Denmark doesn't really have the wherewithal and the know-how on how to fight like the Germans did at this time. And the Danish king gets his rear end handed to him. He is resoundly defeated okay, in 1626, and forced to back off and go back to Denmark. Uh, and when this happens, a lot of people again say, why didn't the war end? Well, even though Denmark didn't have the ability to fight, Denmark has friends, right? Um, and that is where we bring in uh, Wallenstein, okay? So Ferdinand uh, was going... Part of Ferdinand was afraid of Maximilian's power due to the fact that um, Maximilian himself was not in line with Habsburg hegemony, meaning the Habsburgs controlling everything. So Wallenstein here is the one who promised to bring him an army, right? So what ends up happening is that by the time 1628 comes around, Wallenstein or Maximilian could not be controlled. And so this is what's allowing the Danish friends to get involved because while they defeated the Danes, they hadn't crushed the Danes. Okay. And so what was ended up happening instead of the recatholization of these areas was the piece of Augsburg comes back. Okay. Lutheranism is allowed, but they have to give away all their property that they took from the Catholics. They're allowed to practice their religion. They're allowed to have their Lutheran churches. They're not allowed to proselytize. Calvinism is outright banned. No more Calvinism at all, okay? And so this is what's going to uh, kind of begin what we would see here as this idea of freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of identity, things like that. Because one of the things he, uh, that happened here was an altering of the Holy Roman Empire's founding documents. They didn't have a constitution as much. We would probably call it a constitution today, but it was a little bit different. Um, it was more of who's an elector, who's not an elector, and who gets to decide who's an elector. Many people were worried, whether it was Protestants or Catholics, that the way that the war was going, that the Holy Roman Emperor was taking away just normal German liberties, okay? Not just the idea of, you know, defeating Protestants any longer. Because if a Protestant converted to Catholicism, his land would still be taken his title would still be taken because he had fought against the king. And a lot of Germans were afraid that even if they did convert back to Catholicism, they would lose. So just keep in the back of the mind here that 
out of this war, a lot of things are going to happen at the beginning is what we would develop, call the Friedels. Okay. Next comes the Swedish phase. And one of the most well-known generals in modern military history, uh, as well as probably one of the saddest deaths in modern military history. Um, and that's this guy right here on the top right, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. So he is a Protestant. He's also related to the King of Denmark, and he's not happy about the Danish getting their butts kicked. He's also pretty mad that the Germans have decided to take territory on the Baltic uh, Sea, and he wants to take that back. So what he does is he goes, hmm, how do I get more people involved? I got it. This is no longer about religion. This is about politics. This is where we see a shift from this being a Protestant Catholic fight to being a, we've got to stop the Holy Roman Empire fight. And what Gustavus Adolphus does is he goes to the French who are resoundly Catholic and goes to the, who was the political leader at the time, Cardinal Richelieu, and goes, you don't want a strong Holy Roman Empire. I don't want a strong Holy Roman Empire. If they unite, we are dead. We have got to prevent this from happening. And then he goes to the Dutch and he goes, you want your freedom. You don't like the Spanish. You fight with me, I'll help you get your freedom. So this is where we see that shift from a, a religious fight to a political fight. So that brings me to the next question of why did the Thirty Years' War go from religious to political in nature? There are a lot of ways that we can look at this. Um, I would say that it's not that it truly went from religious to political. The religious aspect is still involved, right? Gustavus Adolphus was a staunch Protestant. He believed in the Protestant ideals of Lutheranism. He wanted to avenge his Danish brethren. But he's also having to consider what is the bigger picture at hand. And this is kind of like when uh, kids ask me about, you know, timeframes for comparison or CCOT on an LNQ, how far out do they go? What Gustavus Adolphus is thinking here is he's thinking for posterity. He's not thinking for right now or for 10 years down the road. He's thinking for the future, that if Germany united, Germany is going to be a force that cannot be stopped. Well, the only way to prevent Germany from uniting is if I, as a Protestant, put my Protestant ideals to the side and join with the French, who are Catholic, but don't want a united Germany either. We can agree politically and still disagree religiously. We just will agree not to discuss it. Okay? So the, it does shift to polit political in nature, I would say, but don't forget that the religion is the root. Okay? It's always there, and, and it's not something that it just goes away. And I'll give you an example of why it doesn't go away. Okay? We had the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation starting two years ago. Okay? The Pope... Pope Francis goes to Sweden, if I'm not mistaken, and he's going to go give a speech about the Protestant Reformation, about Martin Luther, and that he did some good things, you know, getting rid of the sales of indulgences. This is bad. You know, we need to, you know, priests have to be educated, things like that. But the head of the Church of Sweden is a woman. In Catholicism, that's not allowed. So 500 years later, we still have a religious argument here because the Pope cannot walk side by side with a woman because he's saying then that she's equal to him. That does not mix with Catholic doctrine. So the religious aspect to this does not go away. It's still there even 500 years later, all right? So just keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about politics, that it's not just political, it is still religious. We're just kind of shifting our focus uh, about it. So with that, Let's get back to our Gustavus Adolphus. So Gustavus Adolphus, a genius on the battlefield. He is probably the one who is credited with creating modern military tactics. And when we say by modern, right, we don't mean 20th century and beyond. We mean from 1600s to the late 1800s uh, tactics, lining your troops up, marching your troops, firing, dropping, firing, dropping, back, things like that. Um, the use of cannons and moving cannons, right? Putting them on wheels and being able to move them around the battlefield, okay? He wins uh, many, many victories for the Protestants. Uh, the Battle of Brighton Field in 1630, he won. Um, he will technically have won the Battle of Lutzen in 1632, but he will be killed here. 
Um, he is going to uh, die a very slow and painful death over a couple of days. And when he dies, it kind of takes the oomph out of the Swedish fight right here. Um, and that is because um, Wallenstein, who was fighting for Ferdinand, he respected Gustavus Adolphus, and that scared Ferdinand, okay? Because if you can respect your enemy, you're willing to look at your enemy as a human, which means you're willing to talk to your enemy. Ferdinand could not have that, right? Because that's how wars work. You have to dehumanize the other side. Otherwise, we're standing in front of somebody. We can't just pull the trigger. It's not that easy. You have to look at that person and go, you're not human. You are not a, a father or brother or a husband or a child. You are an it, and it's okay if I kill you. By Wallenstein having respect for Gustavus Adolphus, that means that he can humanize him and he could theoretically find a way to stop the war. So Ferdinand has him killed. At this time, we still have religion. Again, I told you it's the basis of everything, right? But now we're seeing greed seeping in. Ferdinand needs the northern provinces of the German Empire because if he doesn't have them, he doesn't have any ports. He definitely has to stop the Dutch from pulling away. If the Dutch pull away from the Spanish and the Holy Roman Empire, he's lost a major wool-producing area. It's in the Dutch Golden Age of starting, right? You have the Tulip Revolution that's coming. And, and then politics. The way that the sorry, the way that Gustavus Adolphus gets the French to join in is known as politique. This ideal of politique is again, I don't have to like your religion. I really don't even have to like your politics. But if we have a common enemy, I'm going to work with you to defeat them. There was hopefully going to be a peace settlement here. And it was going to be called the Peace of Prague. Okay, German Protestants, they had decided, okay, we're going to have a compromise with the Holy Roman Emperor. The issue is, is by this time, France and the Netherlands are like, no, no, we're not having this. We're not having a, a piece of anything anymore. This has got to be done. It's got to be decided and finished. And so they're continuously still fighting. Because of that, the Protestants then join the, Swede the Dutch and the French, and there's no compromise. Which leads us to the last phase of the war, the French phase of the war. Uh, the French phase of the war, the Swedes are going to be still involved. Um, but here, what we see is the French are going to be the ones who are still who are doing more of the fighting, while the Swedish are paying for it. During the Swedish phase, the French are fighting. Um, so just remember, uh, Tom Ritchie's got a really great way to think of it when you have the Swedish phase. It's Swedish swords and French francs. Francs is a type of money. When it's the French phase, it's French fists and Swedish stacks, like stacks of money. That's a good way to think about who's fighting and who's paying. Uh, so France officially joins in 1638, okay? Um, because they're sending munitions as uh, well as men, but also financial subsidies. The Germans, by this time, they're just too disunited. They can't stop the French from invading. They can't stop the Swedes and the Danish and the Dutch and the French, okay? And so what ends up happening is you see that what they're going to try to do is if we look at a map of Germany, if you, of Europe, you picture it in your head. This is the Iberian Peninsula. Spain's right here, Catholic. France is next to it, Catholic. Next to France is the Holy Roman Empire, split. The Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish are going to try to squeeze France. But what they forgot about was the Dutch. The Dutch are the ones who are going to get involved as well here. And what they also forgot is that most of this fighting was taking place in what is known as Europe's breadbasket. Okay, those of you that are living in America, you know that the breadbasket is the uh, the Midwestern states. That's where more wheat and corn and all those things are produced in the world, right? Because of how good the land is. Well, in Europe, that's Germany. They produce the main source of their staple goods. And all of this fighting, we're almost now on 20 years of fighting, it has destroyed so much land that there's really nothing they can do to fight any longer because there's nobody to fight because too many people are dying, right? Famine. Famine is a really serious condition that they're having to face. 
And then we also have what's uh, the fact that 8 million people, not just soldiers, people have died. All right? That's a third of what at the time was the German population. Okay, so we went from 24 million down to 16 million people. That's a lot of people to lose. And then we also see at the time we have the rise of witchcraft trials because of so many men dead, women living alone, exerting themselves. It's a lot of things that are happening, right? Uh, because of that, that's what's going to lead us to the Peace of Westphalia. I'm going to stop for a second before going here. I want to tell you a little thing about this little area around here by Bradenburg. That little area, because of uh, the famine that is going on, there is a small king there who is going to decide, I need to save my people. I don't know how to save my people. I know we're going to eat potatoes. And so he introduces the use of the potato into the German diet. Because potatoes grow anywhere. They grow on rocky soil. They grow on rich soil. They grow on poor soil. They grow anywhere. And he is considered to be the savior of that little area of Germany because he introduced the potato and prevented famine from taking too harsh of a hold. There was still a famine, but it wasn't nearly as bad. But I digress. That was just a little thing. I can put it into an essay for you to help. Uh, so the Peace of Westphalia... Uh, this is going to be what ends the war. Uh, the war will continue from 1635 for another 13 years to 1648. Uh, this is what formally and officially ends the 30 years war. Now, one of the key things here was that the whole Roman Empire remains divided. The principalities do not unite. There is no united Germany. Okay, The, the French and the Swedish were very adamant about that. Uh, and the emperor basically had to be an emperor in name only, okay? He cannot get involved into the politics of the German principalities. Uh, this was on purpose, all right? This was to make sure that the Germans were divided, they were politically weak, they couldn't fight against the hegemony of the rising French, because the French are on their way, their way up, right? Now, on a side note, France and Spain, France and Spain have always been the best of frenemies, kind of like France and England, uh, they will join with each other in some things and hate each other in others. France and Spain actually remain at war for another 11 years um, because basically what France is doing is they're honoring their part of the agreement with the Dutch, which is helping the Dutch gain their freedom. And so France is going to try to stop Habsburg Spain from having more territory in Europe. And so we get to the third question I've got here um, and from what are the major outcomes of the 30 years war uh, and was the Treaty of Westphalia successful? So I'm going to start answering the Treaty of Westphalia. Was it successful? Yes and no. I will say that the Treaty of Westphalia was successful and it stopped the war. It brought peace again to Central Europe and it started the idea of using diplomacy over warfare for political differences. So it's successful in that. I will say it's not successful because notice here, it says it reaffirmed the Augsburg formula, right? Quius uh, regio eus religio, he who rules his faith. That's not actually a good thing because that leaves out Calvinism. It left out Judaism. It left out Islam. These were faiths that were being practiced in these areas at that time they are still not legally allowed to practice their faiths in the Holy Roman Empire because of it. So I would say it's successful for use of diplomacy, but it's not successful because it doesn't give true freedom of religion. So with the um, reorganization of Calvinism, what we mean by that is that is where Switzerland gets involved, okay? Uh, Switzerland here it was at that time semi-autonomous, but part of the Holy Roman Empire, very Calvinist area. They are formally recognized as an independent nation known as the Swiss Confederacy. Calvinist, the only Calvinist country that's allowed um, with the Dutch or the Netherlands. Now, Calvinism doesn't really survive in the Netherlands. Eventually, it's going to be the Reformed Church, which is a Calvin church, and the Lutheran Church together. Uh, but Bavaria is going to be brought up here as an elector state, meaning that they're going to be given more power. Brandenburg, Prussia, that's where I was talking about with the uh, potato. They're going to become the most powerful state. Okay. Um, and this Brandenburg Prussian 
state and family as they come up, you'll see how much they can shape the European politics of the 1800s uh, and then later the early 1900s. The Pope was opposed to this treaty. He did not want the treaty to go through. Okay, the issue is, is he had no power because by now we're talking about politics, not religion. Uh, and people were tired of the war, 30 years of war, over 8 million dead, famine, everyone, they needed the peace. Okay? They needed the peace to move on. And so because of that, they are trying to find a way to get through the war. And the only way to do that is to not listen to the Pope. So before we do this POV, let me answer the, uh, the two questions that we've got. Uh, what were the major outcomes of the Thirty Years' War? So the major outcomes of the Thirty Years' War is the beginnings of what we would call freedom of religion. But it's not true freedom of religion. It's only for Catholics and, pro and uh, Lutherans. It does not include Calvinists. It does not include Jews or Muslims. It um, doesn't include the Anglicans, right? If an English person moved to one of those territories, they didn't have freedom of religion. It's the beginnings of the use of diplomacy, or what we know as politique. Okay, I don't have to like your politics. I don't have to like your religion. But if we have an, a mutual agreement on something that we need to get done, we're going to do it together and we'll set that aside. And it kept Germany weak for another 200 years. Very, very, very important. It kept Germany weak for another 200 years. Those are the major outcomes I would say of the 30 years war um, is, the, is freedom of religion developing, politique, and weak Germany. Um, is what I would say you can say are the major outcomes. Uh, Sweden it had its highlight here. That's about it. Sweden's going to go bye-bye. Uh, Denmark's never really had a highlight. Um, so Denmark's kind of go bye-bye. Um, the Netherlands, they're in their golden age. This is their time to shine. It's very quick. It's very bright. And then they go bye-bye. Right? Um, you'll notice in your textbooks that we kind of focus on really about five main countries. Germany. France, England, Russia, and Spain, right? It's sad, but the, sadly, there were issues partly because of this war. It just it destroyed so many political and economic futures of nations. Um, so we've got one more question here from Dylan. Did this famine hurt the Germans mainly or Europe as a whole? That's a really good question, Dylan. Um, it, both. And the way I say the reason I say both is because Germans are the ones who are going to deal with it the longest. Okay, they're the ones who are going to suffer the the longest with it. Um, I'm trying to remember the palace where the Potato King is buried. I want to say it's Schönbrunn, uh, but don't quote me on that. Right? It's it's near Berlin, Potsdam, if I'm not remembering correctly. Um, I went there years ago. Uh, that's the area that didn't suffer a lot in Germany because of the introduction of the potato. But areas like Bohemia and Bavaria and Saxony, they suffered for generations, actually. Um, land does not just regenerate overnight. Land takes years to regenerate, especially when it's been destroyed the way it was destroyed. Europe as a whole, we do know that it affects other countries as well. France has, God, how many famines, right? It's one of the reasons why there is an issue where we get to the 1700s of you know the price of bread famine okay and the fact that the you know they're not growing enough wheat right england i would say does not suffer very much from this at all um because they're raping the land of ireland um spain i would say somewhat yes they're suffering um but spain's getting a lot of food imported from the new world so not as much it's going to be mostly the central european nations okay so that's what I would say is going to be uh, where you would see the main suffering is in Germany, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria, those places that we call today. Uh, if you mentioned this earlier, sorry, but was the Thirty Years' War impacted at all by colonies held by places like France and Spain? Despite A, not being super developed, especially by France, and B, England wasn't all that involved from what I know. They held a lot of major colonies by 1648. Uh, no, they weren't. The colonies weren't really impacted at all um, because this is not a global conflict yet. Um, I know we oftentimes talk about World War I being the first global conflict. Um, I always tell my kids that the Seven Years' War uh, is the first global conflict. I call it World War Zero because that involved the colonies. The Thirty Years' War did not involve the colonies. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. 
Uh, seven years war equals World War One. Don't at me. <laughs> yes, I agree. All right. So let us look at this image right here. We're doing some point of view. Point of view is so so important, guys. Okay. Um, so things to look at. We've got Cardinal Richelieu here on the left. We have got the lion, which represents the Habsburg family and the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, we've got the eagle, um, which is really weird here because normally the eagle is what represents the Habsburg family. Um, it's going to represent the, um, I guess they both represent the Habsburg family to me. Uh, the words are too small for me to be able to read. But what to me is the most important thing is that when you look at Cardinal Richelieu, he's got a plant that he's picking things off of, okay? Um, the issue of the Huguenots has not been solved in France, okay? The issue of the Protestant Reformation has not been solved in France. Um, there are rivals here, okay? There are issues where we are saying who's actually in power. Now, from this point of view, what I would say is what you're seeing is that Cardinal Richelieu being the one who's standing right up, the one who's holding the plant, who's not chained down, he's the one who's holding power. He's the one who's going to say, this is how France is going to be. But with chains, we also need to remember, chains break. And when chains break, all hell breaks loose. And France is not going to be immune from some further issues with the Protestant Reformation. <coughs> so takeaways from this, guys. Uh, this is the beginnings of where we see the intersection of religion and politics. Uh, greed is playing a major issue into this. People want money. They want power. They want to have uh, have it all, basically. The Peace of Westphalia ends the Thirty Years' War by reinstating the Peace of Augsburg. Um, Calvinists are getting screwed out of everything here. Anglicans are not getting involved at all. Uh, and everyone's forgetting that there's a whole other section of European population that are Jewish and Muslim and even Eastern Orthodoxy, right? So I hope this helps you guys. Uh, do you guys have any questions that I can answer for you before we say goodbye? Thank you for joining me, by the way. I do appreciate it. All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, enjoy your time. Don't forget to join Sherry next in about 10 minutes. Uh, going over the scientific revolution, and I will see you guys next week. Kia kaha.